Sorry, I didn't. It just. We're going to pass it in back church. We're going to some water. Woo! Might be cold outside, but it's hot in here. Amen? Yeah, we're about to turn Amen? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Hello? Come on, people. We've got to get the Spirit of the Lord going next morning. We are happy to get in the house of the Lord. Lucas is standing up. He said, I ran, I ran the bench a thousand pounds. I'm so happy. So, But uh, glad to have you guys here with us this morning. Uh, there's a lot of announcements. A lot of announcements. You need to have the Church Center app so that you can read through those announcements and remind yourself. Because I can say all of them, but it's, uh, to remind yourself, you need to have the Church Center app so you can look at them. Uh, one thing before I forget, because I'm forgetful, Karen Hall. Oh, oh, question two after She's question making these blankets. She's going to show you a sample of one. If you want a nice blanket with an impact logo on it, and you want to help out teens to get to summer camp, oh, question two. Three, two. Dan's got those twenty five dollars for the blanket. Ten of ten of those dollars will go to the teen camp. So just see Karen at the church and then tell her about how many you want to get. A dozen, two dozen, hundred. But uh, we'll see her and appreciate uh, people like that that want to help our teenagers get to summer camp. Cody, want to make sure I announce youth is tonight, so don't forget youth group right here in this building. Uh, youth tonight. Also, he has a cornhole tournament. Who likes to play cornhole? Cornhole, yeah. Who likes to compete? No matter what it is, they want to compete in something, right? I mean, that's a that's an opportunity for us to compete. Cornhole tournament. It's uh, fifty dollars a team. Two players on each team. Proceeds, all proceeds go to the youth summer camp. It is on March 13th at 1 o'clock right here at church. So seek, uh, talk to Cody for details. But make sure you sign up uh, and be one to win the prize. We'll have awesome prize for that. Uh, one of the big prizes, of course, is getting our teens to summer camp. Um, my wife, Angie, where's my Angie? Angie she's going to come up here with a lot more enthusiasm than I've got because uh, she's so much more beautiful than I am. But she's going to come up Wow, they did wake up after that. Wow, okay. Are you going to hear announcements now? All right, guys, so every year we put on something called the Extreme Hunt. It's an egg hunt for our community, and we're going to be asking you to help out. That event is March the 27th from 1 to 3 p.m. If you would, and you want to volunteer, please go on the Church Center app and sign up. If you don't want to go on the Church Center app, if you want to see me after church um, and get signed up to volunteer, we would love to have you volunteer for that day. We need all of you. Normally in the past we've had anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 people at this event, so we want to make sure we have plenty of volunteers. Also, in the next week, you will see thousands and thousands and thousands of Easter eggs in that back corner. We're going to ask you to take eggs home and fill them and return them in the next three weeks. And next week we'll get those out here. The ground was too soft to bring the trailer in this week. So we'll have the trailer here next week. We'll have all those eggs and we need to take them home and fill them with candy. And meanwhile, in the next few weeks, we're going to get more announcements about the Extreme Hunt, but I want to just make sure you have the date. I want you to know to uh, start purchasing candy to fill those eggs. And then the night before that event, we'll have an egg stuffing party to fill everything that we have in stuff. But also, if you see these t-shirts and you like them, they're in the back corner. And today, they're one for 10 or two for 15. And um, you'll be able to wear it for the volunteers at the Hunt, so we'd love to have you on one of these as well. Thanks for coming to Impact, and back to you, Tim. Thank you, thank you. Hello, today is sunny and bright with a little ice on the ground, but that's okay. We're all here. Amen. Come on, people. Get All right, so two more announcements. Two more announcements. The bell is pretty good. Men in the house. We've got Men's Bible Center. Josh Bailey does an awesome job leaving. Starts tomorrow night at 645. If you need information, Church Center app has his phone number on it. You can call him. Uh, it also has his address on it. So just reach out to Josh Bailey. If you can't reach out to Josh, reach out to me, and I'll help you get connected. But we are have an awesome men's Bible study. Study the book of Colossians. Book of Colossians, awesome study. And Josh always does a great job of being at his house. James Scott. James Scott. This man over here, he is going to help us with an uh, awesome. Come over here, record quick, James. Or Jim. Come on, get to it, get it. Not as much as my wife, huh? Not as much as I miss my wife. Talk about the men's breakfast you got coming up. Uh, we're really excited about that. It's this Saturday, the 27th, 7.30 in the morning. Hopefully you guys saw the sign that you came through the door or up by the, the video. Uh, but be here Saturday early because 
We're going to have a lot going on, guys. This is sports theme. We're going to have basketball hoop. We're going to have baseball throw, football throw. We're going to throw some axes. So you guys come out. We'll hit the target with the axes. See who can throw the axe the best. Uh, we're going to have some pancakes. And we're going to have bacon. We're going to have a good time. And then uh, I'm going to share my testimony about what God has done in my life to get me through stomach cancer and where he's gotten me today and what he's doing in his kingdom work. So, guys, please bring somebody. Come out be a part of this. It's a great time to not only fellowship and get to know one another, but to hear what God's doing and how you can be a part of this ministry. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. He does a tremendous job with so many different areas. I mean, he does a lot. He does a real lot. I still mess with him. He can put you on the ground quick. Sure. Don't mess with him at all. If I, if I need security, he is my man. I'm going to sit close to him. Talk about uh, one last thing. I forgot about the uh, support. T tonight, Bethel Baptist Church, Bradville, and the Power Source team. Rick Kennedy is on that team. Uh, Power Source tonight, I believe it's 5 30. Is that 5 30, Rick? 5. 5. 5 o'clock, Bedford Baptist Church. Let's fill their church up with exciting people. And let's support Brad as he leads the Power Source team into feats of strength, bending stuff, breaking stuff, all kinds of stuff. Lucas, you going to be there tonight? Lucas is going to be there tonight. So it's going to be awesome in the house of the Lord at Bedford Baptist Church. So let's just go there. I'm part of the family of God, right? Give the gospel everywhere. Let's pray so we can sing. Dear Lord God, thank you so much for the excitement in your house today. Thanks for everyone that has come out. God, we just stop in this moment and say, Father, we need you. We need you to fill this place with your spirit. Father, it's just great to gather together. It's great to encourage one another. Father, you, God, are our focus. From right now to the, the first part of the songs to Brad preaching, uh, you take over this service and lead us and direct us and fill us and challenge us. And Father, let us not hear with our ears, but hear with our heart and apply what you speak to us through song and through the message so that we can leave here walking a little bit closer to you and ready to serve our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Inside Church. Y'all stay in the worship with us this morning. Is Brittany's in the first of the year? Thanks, Lynn. Brittany's up. Give me Brittany's face, please. Brittany's face, just stop. I don't have lyrics. Silence. I don't have lyrics. I don't have what? I don't have the lyrics. It's not just playing on screen. Don't love me once Sorry, to go back to
that will break every chain. And he is raising that army up this morning, an army of believers that will take a stand and fight against the enemy. And we are victorious through him. Y'all sing it out. There's going to be an army rising up. And put your hands together because that's where the power's at. Yeah. 
just pray over this service today that there just be an anointing that continues to flow in this place and let there be healing, God, and victory that takes place in each of our lives because we know that you are a chain breaker and a way maker, God, and we love you and we praise you for that. And God, we just pray and speak an anointing, a special anointing over Brad as he brings the message today, God, that you continue to move this, your spirit through this place. And God, just let there be victory that takes place in this service today and in our hearts. God, we love you and praise you for who you are and all that you do. In your precious name, amen. Life is hard. Every day, anxieties, sin, worries, and fears cloud our vision. They consume us. They rob us of our ability to see clearly, our ability to live. But what if we don't have to live this way? What if we were meant to experience life differently? What if we're meant to live lives full of color, joy, peace, and vitality? What if we're meant to live life in HD? Good morning, Impact Church. How's everybody doing today? Good, man. I hope you come ready to hear the Word of God today. And man, just a, an amazing message that God has uh, laid upon us today as we continue in our Joyride series. So welcome to Impact Church. The tent is packed. The field is packed. God is doing an amazing work, man. It's, I'm so glad that you guys are here. If you're visiting with us today, welcome. Uh, if you're searching for a church home, we hope that the Lord would lead you right here. God's doing an amazing work uh, um, amongst an amazing group of people. We would love for you to be a part of it, to use the spiritual gifts that God has given you to come alongside and be a part of the body of Christ in this movement of Jesus. Because that's what this is. That's what we're on. You're sitting on land. It's a movement of God. And uh, man, we're just getting started. Started. God has an amazing work to do, and uh, man, so he's calling us to trudge forward and, and to keep moving forward in the path that he blazes, so we'd love for you to be a part of it with us, and uh, welcome here today. If you're joining up with us here, maybe you've been the past few weeks, you know that we are going through expositionally through the book of Philippians in a series that we've called Joy Ride, and we've had a lot of messages, and what we've heard from God is these varying ways that we can find and have joy in the things that God has provided to us through his word, through his church, and even in our lives, even in amongst the darkest of circumstances and the hardest of trials that we face. And we've seen Paul here in this situation writing this book of Philippians from prison, chained to a guard, and we've talked about that. And how that his focus is not on himself. His focus is on the gospel. His focus is, is on Jesus and honoring God in his life or in his death. And we've had some amazing messages in that. If you've missed any of those, you need to go back and catch up on them. Because so many people in this world are looking for joy. <laughs> They're searching for joy and happiness and hope. And they can't find it. And I want to tell you, if you can't find it, it's because you're looking for it in the wrong place. Because it's right there. Even in the uncertainty and the difficult times of life, there's joy to be had for a follower of Jesus. So today, our message is no different because we're still speaking on joy. And now we get the message, joy in a worthy walk here today. Joy that comes from a worthy walk. And you see, I warned you guys that I was preaching on this last week, and I thought there was only going to be 50 people here. Some of y'all didn't get the message, like, what? <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. So, man, I, I hope you came hungry for God's word today, because I'm serious, man. It's, it's, a, it's a deep word. It's a message that's not preached frequently in the church of Jesus Christ today, in the 21st century American church, but it should be, because, because it is a frequent message 
all through God's word in the New Testament. Joy in a worthy walk. And we talk about frequently here at Impact, you've heard me say it before if you've been here very long, that, that I hope that you come with a hunger for God's word, but I hope you come ready to allow the word of God to change you, to shape you, to mold you. Because that's a lot about what we're going to be talking about today. So, so we kind of say it, you know, kind of in a funny way. We say, don't come to church at Impact, especially with your steel-toed boots on so your toes don't get stepped on, right? Come with your flip-flops on. Put them boogers on out there and say, Lord, come on. (laughs) Here they are. Because that's how we should come to church every single Sunday. And that's what you're going to get, if, especially if you come here, because we're going to preach the truth of God's word. Because I know and believe that God's word changes us. It shapes our heart and molds us into, into the image of Christ if we let it. If we become not just hearers of the word, but doers. Man, and that's a lot about what we're going to talk about today is this joy in a worthy walk. And I want to introduce this message today by kind of reminding you of a story, and many of you have heard, it's about this uncle and this nephew. And, you know, and, and, and they were good at raising livestock, and they had a lot of livestock, and they were good at working the, the, the fields and, and, and doing and growing crops and doing everything, and they had a lot of servants. And they kind of were doing all this together, but then they got so much stuff, so much livestock, so many servants, they needed so much land that they couldn't stay in one spot, and they had to separate. So the uncle looked at the nephew and said, man, you pick first. You tell me which way you go, I'll go the other. And if you are familiar with God's word, you know that I'm talking about Abraham and Lot. And we know that story, and and Lot said, well, I'm going to go east, right? I'm going to go into the, to the Jordan, to the valley of the Jordan that's near Sodom. Because he looked, and, and it looked beautiful there. And, and the ground was luscious and was ripe for, for everything he had to do. So that's where he chose to go. And I want us to think about this for a second. Because not that his choice was wrong initially in going somewhere that was fertile, and that where he could pr- produce and, and do what God had allowed him to do, but this place where he chose was next to a culture of sin, dangerously close. So close that the Bible says, if you read in the King James Version there in Genesis, it says that that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. I want you to think about that for just a minute. And we know translations say close to Sodom, near Sodom, all that kind of stuff, but toward Sodom. So I almost think that, that he was in full view and hearing distance of this city. Yeah, the, the area where he was, innocently he chose because of what he wanted to do. But he could hear and see the sin of the world. And, and as he went about doing what God had wanted him to do, his tent was toward Sodom. And, and what we find is his tent was so dangerously close that, that, that maybe he could He could see the the, the people. Maybe he could hear the parties. Maybe when it got dry in the valley, and maybe things weren't going just right, he could hear the laughter and and the loud music and the partying going on. And maybe just a part of him thought, well, man, maybe I should, maybe I should come over here. And because what we see is this choice that Sodom made to pitch his tent near Sodom ended up being a choice that would cost him a lot. You see, because what eventually happened is Lot went from living near Sodom to living in Sodom. And it cost him and his family dearly. So my question is today, because you know the rest of the story, is where have you pitched your tent? Where have you pitched the tent of your heart and your life? Have you said it so close to the world that maybe it's enticing you to just come a little closer? I mean, when when, when things aren't just right where God has, has placed you and set you and where God wants you to be, when things aren't going as you plan and you hear the things going on in the world and you see the laughter and you see the parties and you see the temporary pleasures, that are you so close you just want to? Get a little closer. 
where now you're not just near Sodom anymore, but now you're in Sodom. Do you see the point? Followers of Jesus Christ, God has called you and I to be different, to not be like the world. But too many of us that call ourselves followers of Christ have pitched our tent right next to the world. And somehow we think we can enjoy both. And that's not what God has called us to do. You see, what we're going to see here through Paul speaking to us in this passage is that we are called to live so different because of what Jesus did for us. Not because God expects our works of righteousness so that we can gain justification in his eyes. That is not biblical. Because the Bible says our acts of righteousness are like filthy rags to him. But let me tell you what this does mean. Is this life set apart is because of what Jesus did for us. And this life set apart is about the gospel. This life set apart is about yours and my testimony as a soldier of Jesus Christ. And as such, our actions, our conduct, our life is a reflection to others of who Jesus really is. So what kind of reflection are you giving off today? Because our call today is to find joy in a worthy walk. It's not legalism. It's not cumbersome. Because if we're truly in Christ, it's freedom to walk in his commandments. It's freedom to walk in his ways. It's not about rules. It's about life. The freedom that God wants you and I to have as a follower of Jesus that sets ourselves apart from the world where we don't even want to set our tent next to Sodom. Let me pray for us before we dive in. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, right now we come and we worship you. Lord, we've worshiped you in song. Lord, now we want to come and sacrifice our heart and our life to you. We want to make ourselves a living sacrifice to you. Lord, because if your praise is only on our tongue, but it's not on our heart and our life, then the praise that's on our tongue means nothing to you. You said that in your word. So Lord, let the praise that comes out of us be the praise of our life. Speak to us. Lord, we want to walk And what you've called us to. We want to live a life worthy of the calling, Lord. Worthy of what you've done on the cross, Lord. And your sacrifice. And your gift of life. And and the justified, complete work of Jesus at Calvary. That saves us. And Lord, I pray that we would hear this message and know that that this walk, that this conduct, that this life that you've called us to is not what saves us. But is actually a result of our salvation. From your spirit that you've placed in us, Lord. And that if we are truly authentic followers of Jesus Christ, then this is how we live. This is how we desire to live. And Lord, help us because we're so good at messing that up. Because we're in the flesh. So Lord, I pray that you would strengthen your soldiers today. Because I believe, Father, right here at Impact Church, that there is an army rising up for Jesus today. I believe there's people who come hungry and ready to conform to your word, to your truth, and be molded into the image of your son. So, Lord, right now I pray that you would do what only you can do. That nobody would hear or see me because I'm not important. That they would only hear and see you, Father, because you and your word change lives. You and your word change. Bring hope and joy even in a walk that's different than the world. Pray that you would move on us right now, Jesus. We give you glory. Amen. All right, so you know we're in Philippians, right? 
You're probably already there. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 27 through 30 today. In the meat of what we're going to be talking about is in 27 and 28. But let's read that passage together. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. The Word of God says this, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. A lot there. And this being our, our sixth message in the first chapter of Philippians, you can already tell that God's not trying to rush us through his word, is he? And me coming into this this week and thinking this was going to be actually our last message from chapter 1, and God puts a halt on that as he made me divide 29 and 30 up for next week. So there's going to be another message in chapter 1 that's joy and suffering that's coming next week. But right now, our call right off the top of this passage, verse 27, waste no time, in bringing out this main focus point of our message today, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. If you have a written copy of God's word, I want you to underline that, highlight that, star that. And then ask yourself, is your conduct worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because that's our call. You see, in conducting yourselves worthy of the gospel, it's almost a kind of a scary thing to preach about in the church today because, you know, there's a, there's a satanic influence that as soon as you start talking about your conduct in God's word, people always automatically go ahead and label you what? Legalistic. I want to tell you right now that I realize that there is some legalism of the past and maybe even still in the present that has nothing to do with God's word, but when you get right down to talking about your conduct and how you live your life as a representation of Jesus Christ and the things you and I choose to do, either reflect Christ or reject Christ, then I want to tell you that that's biblical and is nowhere near legalism. As a matter of fact, if we're not careful and I realize there are such things as legalism. And legalism, basic concept is saying that you're doing to works to justify, uh, to make yourself justified in the eyes of Christ or to earn your salvation. And, and that is unbiblical. All right? That is legalism. But let me tell you what, the works and the conduct of life that come out of salvation are not legalistic. But Satan wants to make you think they are. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, and I don't want to get stuck here, but we know that there's this kind of satanic influence of, of freedom in Christ that sounds really good on the surface, but when you dig down deep, what people are getting into is, hey, that I, I'm, I'm labeling, I'm living under this freedom in Christ means that I want to live my life the way I want to live it, so that if I want to listen to trashy music, I can do it. If I want to drink, I can do it. If I want to party hard, I can do it. If I want to do whatever I want in the world, I can do it, because God's grace abounds. That is the theology of Satan, y'all. Because Romans even says, so what are we going to do? Continue in sin so his grace abounds? Absolutely not. Mm -mm. I don't know where somebody got that. Oh, I do know where they got that. They got that from a heart of evil that wants to sin and have their Jesus too. That's where that came from. That came from a heart that doesn't want to fall in line in obedience to God's word. That's where that came from. That didn't come from Jesus. All right, so we need to be very clear on what we're talking about here. You see, truthfully, this idea, this concept of conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel or conduct yourselves worthy of God, Paul is going to say 
in four different letters in the New Testament. How many of you believe if God led somebody to say something four times to you and me, it's pretty daggum important? I'm going to tell you, man. Screaming from the rooftops. He'll say it here in Philippians 1. He said it in Ephesians chapter 4. He'll say it in Colossians chapter 1. He'll say it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And it's imploring these churches who he's preached to, who have fallen away from the gospel, who have had sin and, and, and worldliness leak back into their life and into their doctrine. He's calling them back out of it. So do you think if Paul was alive today, what would he say to America? Oh, mm. that'd be a deep letter. You know what I'm saying? Wouldn't nobody come to Paul's church? <laughs> be like, Yo, man, I'm going to get my ears tickled somewhere else, man. They do crazy. But that's the gospel. That's our calling. And so many people want to run away from it. And that's why I, 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 we talked about the beginning. No, come to that. Let's, let's get our toes stepped on today. So that we can be formed more into the image of Jesus. And this isn't the only place. And Paul's not the only one to talk about this. You talk about your walk. You talk about your conduct. And I could go on for days. But I, I put a few right here. How about 1 John 2 and verse 6 which says, Whoever abides in him, meaning Jesus, should walk in the same way he did. Ooh. How about Galatians 5 says, walk or live by the Spirit so you do not gratify the desires of the flesh. Talking about your walk, your life, holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, you receive from us how to walk and please God and do so more and more. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 as you receive Christ Jesus, so walk in him. 1 Peter 1 says, he who called you as holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Romans 13 says, let us walk properly as in the daytime. And so not into sin. And it lists a bunch of sinful desires and circumstances. 1 John 16 says, if we say we have fellowship with God while we walk in the darkness, then we lie and do not practice the truth. Ephesians chapter 5 says, you were once darkness, and now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Why is that not preached anymore? We get a bunch of motivational sermons and, and feeling good, fluffy stuff, and nothing that ever steps on our toes and brings us to repentance to form into the image of Christ. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is the only way that revival will ever happen in any nation ever is if God's people get serious about their conduct, about walking worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not in a legalistic way, but in a big time serious way about what Jesus did on that cross for you. That's where it's at. It's all over the New Testament. And if you're getting upset and you want to write me an email, don't send it to me. Send it to, to Jesus at heavenlyway.com. This is his word. It's not mine. I'm just a messenger. You can shoot me if you want, but it doesn't change this. It doesn't change it. Never changes it. And it's a lost concept in our church today with this false gospel that says we can have our sin in Jesus too. So instead of making war against our sin and our flesh and against worldly patterns, we long to justify our sin and make excuses for our worldliness and our flesh. All in the face of his grace. <laughs> that he sent his only son to die to set us free from that. And yet somehow we try to make an excuse as to how we can still walk in that because of his grace. That's not why Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross because he loved you and wants to set you free from that because he's got better for you than that. He went to the cross because 
He wants you to surrender your heart and life to him. He wants you to take up your cross now and follow him, to be his disciples, and to not sit back with our arms folded and our hand out like a stiff arm, like a running back, pushing away the defense. That's how we come to God sometimes. It's like, God, I want all the feel-good stuff. I want the grace, mercy, love, forgiveness. Who wouldn't want that? Daggone, man, who wouldn't want that stuff? That's, I'll take all that you want to give me. But this holiness, conduct, living worthy, being conformed in the image of the Son, joy and persecution, all that stuff, no, stiff arm, that stuff. All I want to hear is this. And that's the message that fills up basketball arenas <laughs> and stadiums. It makes pastors popular. But this is the message of truth, and this makes pastors unpopular. And the Bible says makes people in the end times run away to the teachers that want to tickle their ears. You see, what we're talking about there is being preached as basically cheap grace. A pastor and theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, said in part of his quote on grace, it says, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. You hear that all over the place. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Cheap grace is grace without the cross. Sacrifice, surrender. We see that continuously. You see, God's grace is through him and is only manifested in repentance. That's where God's grace is, is in repentance. And yes, while we were still sinners, Christ's love was, was demonstrated for us. Yet yeah, nothing can separate you from the love of God. God loves you even in the midst of your sin. But his grace is only manifested through repentance from that sin. You see, there's a difference. Yes, he loves you. But to those who want to call themselves a follower of Christ, there is a repentant step in process to walk into his grace and forgiveness and mercy. And once you're there, then there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The enemy wants to keep bringing that up, your past, maybe even your current faults. But God wants to separate you from that through the forgiveness at Calvary. But so many times we only choose to give God part of us. And rarely the parts that cost. But God's called us to take up our cross and follow him. You see, we want to give him the parts that are easy to change. But we don't want to give him the parts that we really want to hang on to ourselves. We want to pitch our tent next to Sodom. So we can still be a part of the party. <laughs> and have the abundance in the valley too. But God's called us away from Sodom. I want to bring up this animal here that I know if you're on Facebook, you saw this picture that we put up for this message today for joy in a worthy walk. Now, it might be coming. It's a little white animal. When you see it, when you know it, you'll see it. That's not me. <laughs> I'm not white and furry and cute. So it'll come up in a second, maybe. And if it doesn't, I'll explain it. So it's this ermine and, and it's a the north american ermine and basically in the summertime this weasel is what it is is brown with a white belly just a normal looking weasel okay but in the winter this weasel turns pure white snow white with just a black tip on its tail and, of course, they say the black tip just kind of to, to deter predators that come and chase it or birds that kind of come down and try to get it because the wagon tail distracts them, whatever. But the rest of the coat is pure white. What are you getting at, Brad? What's so important about that? This animal, knowing that its fur now is pure white, doesn't want to get it dirty. It'll go to great lengths to make sure it stays clean. And doesn't stain its white coat. So much so 
that hunters have the, found this out about this animal. All right, this animal that's pure white coat that they used to, to kill it and, and make furs, and the fur was saved for royalty. This animal doesn't want to get dirty. It's perfect. And the hunters realize that this animal doesn't want to get dirty so bad that it'll even fight to its death before it gets dirty. So this is what they do. It's almost kind of mean, but they know when, when this ermine is out of its hole where it buries underground and they know that it's out and about, they'll go and they'll spread mud or tar or something around the hole where it goes into. And then they'll turn the dogs loose on it. There it is right there. See, that's a whole lot cuter than me, ain't it? Right there. So you can see this thing, and they spread this mud and this tar around the hole, and they turn the dogs loose to chase and run it. And then when the ermine gets tired of running finally, and it goes back to its hole, and it sees that there's mud or tar or whatever around their hole, it will not go in it because it doesn't want to get dirty. So it will turn and fight to its death facing the attacking dog. Guys, in Isaiah, the Bible tells us that when we come to Christ, that he's going to make our lives and, and our sin white as snow, that though it be as scarlet, he's going to make it as, as white as snow and wool. Guys, when you've come to Christ, he's turned you clean. Your sin is now as far as the east is from the west to him. He remembers your sin no more. And he's made you pure, white, and clean. But how easy is it for us to not really care and just flop back in the mud of the world? Even a little animal knows better than to defile its white coat. But yet, the sacrifice that's made us clean, we almost take for granted and use it to justify why we need to get back in the mud some more. But God's called us to something different. You see, this process of making us clean and whole through Christ starts with repentance, and it's finished with repentance continual repentance that refines us and we'll talk about that at the end and this whole process is done through Christ and through the spirit of God and through the finished work at Calvary the same grace the same mercy that justifies you is the same grace and mercy that will sanctify you if you let it if you will resolve in your heart to continuously repent and die to yourself and die to the ways of the world and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and align your life with his word that he will cleanse and purify you from the inside out and he will put a new desire and a new direction in your heart that you didn't have with your flesh alone. And it only comes through the Spirit of God now inside you. That's what we're talking about. And see, the big error today is we define holiness as mere acts of human effort. And that's not what holiness is. Holiness is a state of being because of the work of Jesus. I'm going to say it again. Somebody needs to write that down or tweet it. Holiness is not merely the acts of human effort. It is instead a state of being because of the work of Jesus. That's what God's called us to. That's what he's called us to. So in that definition and in that concept, now that we know the truth of God's word, we realize that grace never lowers the standards of holiness. Never. Grace never lowers the standards of holiness that God's word calls us to so in light of that is anybody else besides me concerned about what you see going on in the world going on in the church of america who's let sin creep in so much that now the followers of jesus don't look any different than the people of the world it's because we've lost this call to discipleship this call to holiness this call to being formed into the image of christ and God wants to give us better. God wants to take us out. Why? 
Because we're bought with a price. Did you know your life's not your own? We treat it like it is. But it's not. You and I are bought with a price. We are, we are the perfect creation of the holy God that has the blueprint for your life. And he loves you so much, he paid the price for your sin. The penalty that was due you because of sin and the depravity of man, he paid at Calvary so that we could walk in freedom. Not freedom to sin, but freedom from sin. Come on, somebody. Stop making excuses and start making war on your sin. Not just war on everybody else's sin. Uh Uh-oh. Make war on your sin. Then go help your brother. Get that plank out of your eye. Then go get that speck. Man, we're so good at casting down other people's sin, and we don't worry about the sin in our own heart. It's about time we do. Ephesians chapter 4, I want to go ahead and read that passage in verses 1 through 6 for us where Paul kind of mirrors this thought as we delve into it a little deeper. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, Paul says this. says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So we see that this calling comes out of Ephesians, then to Philippians, and in, in, in this bond, in this, in this calling, there is a bond of unity that's developed. I want us to see that, because that's what we're going to talk about as we get into this. Now that we've really defined and we know spiritually, through God's word, what this walking worthy of our calling is through scripture, now we know that this is going to bring something. There, there is a purpose to this. It's not just so people can say, oh, look at what a good Christian you are. Woo, that's not it. There's a purpose for which God wants you to walk in a a manner worthy of your calling. There's a purpose, and it's not about you. It's about him being glorified and about others. We've said it before. God doesn't need your righteous works, but your neighbor does. Think about that. They need to see Jesus in us. But the problem is we have a bunch of tares hanging out with the wheat. (laughs) They'll be separated one day but it's messing up the image of Christ on this earth. You know, I read this Ephesians, and we know Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, and we just went through that as a church, and we know this this calling, and that was a a deep series, and and it it was a, a very strong series, because in this book, especially these last three chapters, you know, the first three, Paul was basically telling us who we are in Christ. And, and what Christ did for us. And now because of that, 4, 5, and 6 in Ephesians, he's telling us because of that, now we're to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And he lays out this whole plan for what it looks like to live on this earth as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Talked about everything, and we went through all that. And it's beautiful. And I think back at the, the words of a, a, a Lecrae, a, a Christian rap artist, in a song that he put. And it says, I don't live life scared to death. Because when I take my last breath, the next step is there in text. I'm not a legalist, and I ain't hating, but there's things I don't and won't do. Yeah, I read Galatians, and I keep reading Ephesians, because if it's Christ we believe in, we should not be confused with the heathens. Yeah, you pump that stuff into you, driving down the road all the time and working out That'll start feeding your mind, won't it? There's another sermon for another day. Get the trash out of your head. Put the good stuff in there. It'll change your mind. And that's how we're transformed is through the renewing of our mind. Put God's word in there, even if it's through song or whatever else, where there's constant molding your mind into the image of Christ as well. It's beautiful. Look at 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Talk specifically here to what we're talking about. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him 
who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commands. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. What's the love of God? That we keep his commandments. What can we paraphrase that as? That we walk in a manner worthy of our calling. That we great commission that Jesus gave, that we make disciples and then we what? Teach them to obey all that I've commanded you, right? You see, obedience in Christ is not a bad word, guys. It's not. It is a sanctified, holy word of a disciple of Jesus Christ is what it is. Obedience to his word. God's word continues to say, his commandments are not burdensome. There it is. If you're truly in Christ, this word is not burdensome to you. There's a hunger and a deep down desire for you to live this out. I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to trip because I'm still in the flesh of my body, all right, because I've been justified through Christ. I'm, tr- I'm trying to continue to be sanctified, and I will never, ever be completely into the image of Christ until I'm in my glorified body. So you go from justified to sanctified to glorified. Glorified doesn't happen until eternity one day in heaven. So there's a continual process of sanctification that needs to take place on this earth for a disciple of Jesus. Has to. And the Bible says that these commands aren't burdensome. It's almost, and and even Ezekiel 26 said that he'll give a desire for you. Hey, I'll put my spirit in you. I'll put this new heart in you. I'll take out that heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you, and I will give you a desire to follow my word. Woo! Do you have a desire to follow God's word? If his spirit's in you, you should. That's what your Bible says. Oh, man, that's different, right? For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It's beautiful. So let's real quick pull out these three things that Paul says in our passage in Philippians here that he points out that are three marks, if you will, of living worthy of our calling, living worthy of the gospel. And and there's one he comes out, he says, living in one spirit, striving for the faith, and then basically living fearless in opposition. So those are three things that if if we're walking in a manner worthy of our calling, now these things come to be in our life, okay? So if you put these three marks of living worthily in the gospel into like one statement, it would say we are living worthy of the gospel when we are striving for the faith of the gospel with unity and fearlessness. Because it will change you. It changed Paul. It will change us. You see, this manner of life, this, this living our life according to Christ and being sanctified, it produces fruit that honors God. And we see this from verse 27, that this manner of life brings steadfastness. That stand firm that we get this call from in this passage. It brings unity that's in one spirit. It brings work, a desire for effort in the gospel, that's striving, and it brings partnership, doing it side by side in a fearless fashion. You see, God has in mind, I think, in this passage, the kind of effort that leads his spirit to spread the gospel through our lives at a quicker rate. I've always heard it said, or I've heard it said before, said, always tell people about Jesus And when necessary, use words. That'll make you think about your conduct, won't it? Do people see Jesus in me? And you see, not to take away from anything else, because people don't come to Jesus because of us. Let's make that very clear. People only come to Jesus because of the Holy Spirit drawing them in their heart. And the Bible says that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. So it's not just about you, but God has invited us to be part of his plan in how we live our life. And then as they see Christ in us, then the desire should swell up in them. What's different about you? How do you handle that so well? How do you treat that person differently than I would? How do you fill in the blank? Because I see something different in you. And then out of that, it 
makes them desire to know what you have. And then that's when you break out God's word and you let the Holy Spirit of God do his work through his word. You see that? That's beautiful stuff right there. It's not about you. It's about God. And he's invited us to be a part of it through how we live our life through the spirit. And I love this because it speaks of this need of being fearless before our opponents. And we're going to talk about that again here just real quick in a second. And we know that he's calling this, this effort, this work, this striving to be done in public. That it's a public conduct because later in chapter 2, because he'll refer to them as lights shining in the world in, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So we know that there's this calling out, all right, that this, this desire for the church to shine as lights, to live differently. And we see here in, in verse 27 in this passage where it says it doesn't matter whether I come see you or I'm absent. And we talked about that the past couple weeks because Paul knew God was going to deliver him. He just didn't know how. That might even be delivered him to himself. He might die. And he, his only thought was, I want to honor God even in that. I do not want to back down from the faith even in the face of Caesar. So then he says, I don't know where I'm coming to you or whether I'm not. That's up to God. He says, but man, this is what I want to do. I want to hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. Stand fast. Stand firm. What do you get the idea of? Be strong. Don't quit. Don't be strong physically. Be strong spiritually. Be strong in, in Christ and through his spirit. And it gives the idea of never quit. Don't give up. Galatians 6, 9. Don't grow weary in doing good. For in a proper time, you will reap a harvest if you do not, what? Give up. Smack the person beside you and tell them, say, don't give up. You might tell them to wake up. But tell them, definitely tell them, don't give up. Right? Tell them, don't give up. Because I know there's some people in here, man, it's easier to quit than it is to keep going. Because the enemy just keeps pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding. And believe me, you ain't telling me no secret. I'm a church planner. The enemy hits hard every direction he can from outside and from within. And it is easier to quit every day than to keep going. But I've got Galatians 6, 9, and I've got a call, and I don't know what else I'd do if I ran away from this. This is what God called me to do. What else am I going to do? Nothing. I know this is what God's called me to. So we're going to stand firm in what he's called us to. What has he called you to? He may not have called you to plant a church, but I guarantee you he's called you to lead your, your family well, mom and dad. In the word of God, I guarantee you he's called you to, to, to righteousness, to holiness, and to stop making excuses for sin. What has he called you to? That you can shine the light of Christ to others in this world. Stand firm. Don't quit. So we get this concept right here, right off the bat, where he says stand firm, what? In one spirit. That gives the idea of unity. And we're going to talk about this in a couple weeks, so I'm not going to expound on this really any further. But just to say that we know we had a message a few weeks ago about joy in the gathering, and we know we need each other. And that's why Satan, I believe, has been so hard-pressed for the past year of making church non-essential. <laughs> Trying to make people, pastors, close their church down and everything because of COVID. All right, whatever. All right, because, hey, man, there's power in the gathering, and if we can do it safely, we need to do it. And that's why we, we do what we do, man. We, we bring people in here. We've got the windows so you can do it outside. You can drive in. Hey, it, I guess before long it's going to get warm. I don't know. And we can open up the back again and people be sitting outside or whatever. We're going to have church. Because there's power in the gathering. And there brings this spirit of unity inside of us. And Paul wants to hear that from these Philippians. He says, man, I, I want to hear, man, whether I, whether I go or whether I come to you, I want to hear that you're, that you're standing firm and you're together. And it gives this idea of locked arms, man, that we're, that we're locked in tight, that we're doing life together, that we're with each other, that we're encouraging each other, and that we're keeping each other accountable too. Man, do you have an accountability partner? Maybe you're struggling with some things in life. I mean, a brother or a sister in Christ that, that can really just, hey, how you doing in that? And then you keep them accountable. And we iron, sharpen iron. We do life together. We keep each other accountable to, to keep walking in a manner worthy of our calling. Man, that's what unity brings. And especially inside a church that, that God's wanting to do a work forward. Satan would want to do nothing more than to get in where there's a group of believers with locked arms and start to pry them arms apart. Just loosen them a little bit. That way when the strain gets tough, whoop, oh, lost that one, whoop, 
lost that one. And pretty soon this strong chain that God formed together becomes these little bitty pieces that ain't worth nothing by themselves. We need to bond together as a church of Jesus Christ. We need to bond together as impact church. We need to bond together as elders. We need to bond together as staff. We need to bond together as a congregation and stop warring with each other and get busy about the gospel of Jesus Christ and doing what God wants to do because Satan wants nothing more than to divide this junk up. So Paul wants to hear, I want to hear that you're standing firm and that you're in one spirit together. That's what I want to know. And that's what I want to know. Paul came back to Impact Church and wrote a letter today to Impact. All right? First Impact, chapter 1. He said, I want to know that when I come back that y'all are standing firm together in one spirit. That's what I want to know right now. Are y'all grounded in the gospel? Are y'all have your eyes fixed on Jesus? Or do you have your eyes fixed on what you want? Big difference. Number two, he says, I'm going to come back. I want to hear that you're striving For the faith. Look at that beautiful picture. That you're in one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And this word that Paul uses here for strive is sonathleo. Man, I ain't good at that stuff. I don't know what that verse says. I can't pronounce it. But inside of it is like the word athleo, where we get our word athlete. All right? So you start thinking about this striving. And it's the same word that Paul would use later in 2 Timothy where he describes that an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And this word gives the idea of fighting together. Again, bringing in the unity, encouraging each other, accountability, and we're striving for the faith. We're not backing down from our adversaries. And I mean, again, honestly apprehensive about using the word work in a sermon (laughs) when it has to do with Jesus because people automatically start thinking, oh, work. You know, you're talking about, you're talking about a work-based faith. No, we are not talking about that, all right? And Paul is not talking about that. So Paul is not calling us to a, a work-based faith or a work that saves you, all right? It is the work that follows salvation. Can we get that clear? This is the work that follows being in Christ, having his spirit in you. It's now that you're saved. In other words, you don't do good works to get saved. You do good works because you're saved. And now you strive and you get serious about the discipline of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Your effort, your work, this striving toward the gospel is not to earn you love, but it's because of the love that's been freely given to you. And it creates a desire to go hard for the gospel of Christ. Do you have a desire in you to go hard for the gospel? To make sure that other people see Jesus in your life, in your family's life, in your church's life. Do you have a desire for that? Man, it's so easy for us to fall into the pit of easy Christianity. Where we just think we can get saved and come back and just kind of be pew sitters and sit on our hands and, and don't do anything and don't be about the gospel in any way, shape, or form. And church almost becomes this thing we just check off as part of our week. Whoop, did that. Whoop, did that. God's got more for you than that. Way more. There is power in life and joy in a life in Christ. And God wants you to walk in it. These three uses of this word, strive, labor, compete, this effort, this discipline idea, means that we're striving together for something. And that gives this idea of walking in a manner worthy of our calling, and then we're together in it, charging forward for the gospel. Because we need to stand for the truth of God's word. Because unfortunately, many churches and followers of Jesus are changing their doctrine. They're not standing, they're folding. And that's unfortunate. And it's high time that we expect more out of the people who call themselves pastors. It's high time that we expect more out of their preaching. It's high time that we expect more out of what they stand for and what they say if they get a chance in public on the news and everything else. And they don't cower to what the community or what the culture would like to hear, but they only say what God wants them to say. You see, we have too many what I call pulpit pansies in our churches today. 
They just want to tickle some ears and be popular. The good thing is, though, yeah, there's a trend toward that. But the good thing is, is I'm hearing and I'm seeing that there's some Christians, some pastors, some churches who want to take a stand as to why we exist and what the Word of God is. There are some. There's not extremely a lot today, but there are some that will do it. And that's an exciting thing. I want to tell you right now, if you're visiting today, if you've been here, you're worried, you know, about where you should join. I want to tell you right now that the commitment of Impact Church is to be a contender for the faith. It's to strive for the gospel. And that we want to be a contender for the faith in a powerful, yet loving and kind, but unapologetic way. We're not going to apologize for what God's word says. When it comes directly against sin, we're going to call sin what the Bible calls sin. And we're going to preach it in love, not hate and condemnation and, and beating people over the head with the Bible. But saying, hey, God wants to set you free from that. Because there's pain and destruction at the end of that, even in this life, but especially for eternity. So we will preach the truth. You come here to Impact Church You will get real preaching every week, every single week. And if somebody's in my place, they'll be real preaching or they won't preach no more. (laughs) We're not tickling ears here. We're preaching the truth of God's word. Because here's the thing. If you preach real like God wants you to, people will either start hating sin or hating the pastor. Want to preach in such a way that something's going to happen here. Either you're going to run to the altar or you're going to run out the doors. And God's prepared my heart for both because it's not about me anyway. It's about him. I would hope you run to the altar and not out the door. No matter how much this word steps on your toes. Because my commitment to you is to never give you my opinion. Or to give you somebody else's opinion. I don't care how smart they are and how many degrees they have in in divinity. I don't care about the opinion of man. I care about what God's word says. So we're going to preach truth here, and we're going to back it with God's word, because then you don't have to worry about what my opinion is, because my opinion doesn't matter anyway, and neither does the best theologians. Only God's word matters. Third, final point that Paul brings up here is this worthy of the gospel walk. Brings us to a point where we're not terrified in the face of our adversaries. Are you terrified in the face of your adversaries to stand on God's word? I mean, on the people that you know, that you know that you know, don't stand for it. Don't love God. Don't believe in God. Stand for something different. Are you scared to speak up? Are you scared to walk differently around them? Teenager, you scared to say that, Man, I know I should be listening to to music that glorifies God, but I'm just going to do what my buddies are doing. So you kind of flow with the peer pressure. You see, that starts innocent right there, but then if if you continue in that way, that that step of peer pressure, remember Lot, how he got closer to Sodom, and and, and then uh, then he's in Sodom? Hey, that's what's going to happen, teenager. If you keep giving in to that peer pressure, right now you may be near Sodom, but I promise you, if you keep going, you're going to be in Sodom before you know it. And sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and always make you pay more than you're willing to pay. Make no mistake about it. It's no joke there. So make a stand now, even in the face of people who are doing different. Because here's the beautiful thing. They may make fun of you at first, but then when they see, like we're talking about, something different in you, and and they see a a, a light of Christ in you, they may want what you have instead of you wanting what they have. That's why it's so important to be different as a follower of Christ. That's why. That's why. It's not legalism. It's about Jesus. I love Adrian Rogers' quote. He says, if I please Jesus... It doesn't really matter whom I displease. But if I displease Jesus, then it doesn't really matter whom I please. It's a good word. Really good word. Who are you pleasing today? Who are you living to please? Jesus or the world? God wants to use you as a catalyst for revival. Did you know that? In your home, in your school, in your community. 
And it starts by standing firm in Christ. So this is the tone that we get from Paul who's calling us to this, this supernatural courage to stand in the face of our adversaries. And Isaiah 41.10 says, fear not, for I am with you. God's called us to fear not. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And we know 2 Timothy says that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, of, of power, of sound mind. That that's what God gives us. He did not give us a spirit of fear. But there's too many people lost in fear today. You see, all of this hope and all of this light of Christ shining, even in the face of our adversaries, is lost when we as followers of Christ get lost in fear. When we, standing with God on our side, choose to live in fear, those looking for true life and love and hope will have no reason to see or even know who God really is, that he's all-powerful, that he is hope, that he is joy. They won't see it. You see, they'll see the light cowering to the darkness rather than the darkness cowering to the light. What do people see in us? God wants us to be courageous. You could go through all kinds of examples in the Bible of Deuteronomy, Joshua, 1 Chronicles, Psalms, Book of John, 1 Corinthians, where God has called us to be courageous, to not live in fear, even in the face of adversity and even in the face of our adversaries. If God's for us, who can be against us, right? It's easier said than done. So it takes a resolve to stand. In closing, we know we talked about this citizenship of heaven these past two weeks and how God has, through, through this citizenship that we have, that, that now we know we can find joy in it, even through the toughest of times. And we talked about that the past two weeks. And we, we built this big wall of concrete up here last week with cinder blocks that almost fell on John Scalise's head. And, uh, and, and, and we had this idea of, man, that we're, God wants us to rise above our circumstances and see the eternal perspective. And because of our citizenship in heaven, now, this is beautiful, now we can live a life worthy of the gospel. That is when we're grounded. Are you grounded eternally like that to know that what your life is about? And it's not just about the superficial here and now, that it's about eternity. So as such, that's why we should allow our conduct and our life to be shaped and molded into the image of Christ. God has more for us. Any other life slights the gospel. There's a conduct worthy of the gospel, and anything other than that slights it. I want you to think about that. Dilutes it. Makes it not look as appealing to the world. Make it almost look absent. Because so many times, there's not a, the, you know, the, the secular kind of idea is there's almost not a penny's worth of difference between a follower of Christ and, per, and a person in the world anymore. I've heard people say that. I've counseled people that said that. That's deep. And I see Satan using that to push people away when our calling is to draw them to Christ through Christ in us. Here's the beautiful thing. We're not going to be measured against somebody else and what they did. We're not going to be measured against a Jerry Falwell or a Billy Graham. But we will be measured against what we could have done had we chose to live differently. You will be measured against that. You will give an account and I will give an account if we're in Christ at the judgment seat of Christ one day for everything we've done and how we lived our life and how we conducted our life. Was it worthy of the gospel? Or did it look no different than the world? Was the life we lived more popular in the frat house or in God's house? Guys, it's time we get serious about Jesus and our faith. You see, this book will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book if you let it in. 
So you and I can either be whooping sin or sin can be whooping us. We don't have the strength on our own to overcome our own imperfections. It's only through the spirit and the power of God in us that we can even have a chance to be set free. It's the only way. Will you surrender to it today? Just so you don't think it's only me that talks like this. John MacArthur says, the believer who walks in a manner worthy of the calling with which he has been called is one whose daily living corresponds to his high position as a child of God and fellow heir with Jesus Christ. His practical living matches his spiritual position. That's beautiful. Does your practical living match your spiritual position in Christ? Charles Spurgeon, do I live as carelessly and worldly as unbelievers while professing to be a follower of Jesus? If so, I'm exposing Christianity to ridicule and leading people to speak evil of the name by which I am called. There's a danger we're facing in society where Christians don't live like Christians, guys. It's because we haven't been serious about discipleship and surrender to a walking in a conduct worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's about fast time we do. So let's surrender all today. Every single one of us, let's lay it down. Let's put ourselves before the throne of God and just say, God, right now, in me, search me, oh God, and know my ways. Remember that? Examine myself. See, let me examine myself. See if I'm really of the faith. God knows the heart. So you say, say, search me, God, and let me know if there's anything in me that's not of you, that's of me or that's of this world, and I want you to remove it. I want you to get it out. Could you honestly say that today? And would you be obedient when he puts his finger on something? Or would you just say, oh, no, 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 God, not that. I will push that in the closet, shut the door. You can have the whole house, just not this closet. Will you let him have it all today? What is it? What is it that he wants to pull out the worldliness, the secularism, the sin that so easily entangles? You know, what God wants to do in us is a lot like how a goldsmith refines gold. You see, a goldsmith will take gold and he'll put it in this crucible and he'll apply heat to it. And it starts to heat up and bubble. And inside this gold, when he it, when it first gets it, there's impurities in it. And this heat, as he applies it, brings the impurities to the top. And as it comes to the top, the goldsmith takes his little device and he skims the top and pulls out the impurities impurities out of the gold. You see, that's what God wants to do with us. God wants to oftentimes use trials, difficulties, persecution even, to bring to the surface impurities in our life. Ultimately, he wants to use God's word, who the Bible says is, a, is, is like a fire inside my heart, that if I even want to speak against God, that the word of God won't let me because it's like a fire in my heart and in my bones. That fire wants to bring impurities to the surface so that God could skim them off. Have you surrendered your life to Christ like that? I mean, maybe you've come to Jesus before, but have you surrendered to the purification process of your life to the goldsmith of Jesus Christ? Because he wants to pull the impurities out. He wants to pull the worldliness out. He wants to pull the sin out. He wants to pull everything out that's not of him. And this process continuously takes place with this goldsmith. Did you know that? Because he wants it pure. So what he does, he has to turn up the heat a little more each time. So once the, the first impurities come up and he gets those out, then he has to make it a little hotter to bring the next level of impurities to the surface. Do you see where I'm getting? How many times do we ask, oh, Lord, please get me out of this, when maybe the Lord is using the heat to bring the impurities out? So maybe our prayer should be instead of, Lord, get me out, should be, Lord, turn up the heat. <laughs> Take out of me whatever is not of you and is of me. So how does the goldsmith know when his work's complete? After he's gone through this process time and time again, skim the impurities, turn up the heat. Skim the impurities, turn up the heat. And he doesn't stop until he gets a pure product. So how does he know 
when that's taken place. The goldsmith knows that the gold is pure after he's turned up the heat so much and skimmed the impurities that he looks in that gold and sees a reflection of himself. There's no more impurities at the surface. And all he sees is an image of himself. Guys, can we get serious about a conduct worthy of the gospel that allows God to turn up the heat in our life and remove the impurities as we say yes to him and allow these impurities to come to the service so that he could skim them off until that we are one day pure and complete and he sees the image of Jesus in us. Bow your head and close your eyes. Have you surrendered your life like that to Jesus? If you've never done it before, I want you to do it today, right now. If you've never done it at all, period. You've been running from God, maybe. Searching for your happiness and hope in the world. I want to offer you a chance today to come and be made whole at the foot of the cross. Maybe you feel like your life's to pieces. Can I tell you it'll remain that way until you have Jesus at the center of your life? It doesn't mean that everything will go well from that point forward. But what it will mean is that in the midst of the storm, that you'll have a perfect peace and joy like Paul had sitting here in this prison writing this word to us. Things aren't going well on his account. He's facing death. How much worse could it get? But he still has joy. Do you have that? That's the peace in the storm that God wants to give you right now in your life. Will you surrender all to him? To receive him for the first time, I'm going to lead you through a prayer here in a minute. I want you to just realize your depravity, realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And I want you to ultimately call call out to God with your heart. You see, the words won't save you. The prayer doesn't save you. It's your heart, Romans 10 tells us, that justifies you and by which you are saved. Will you call out to him? Maybe you hear and you say, Brad, I accepted the Lord the previous time. I've been walking in and out of church doors most of my life, even recently. But I know that I've walked away, that I've once had this white as snow in Christ's appearance, but I've been too willing to run back in the mud and mess it up. So today I want to come, I want to ask for forgiveness, I want to re-surrender, and I want to enter my life into God's refining process right now so that I could have a walk worthy of my calling. If that's you, I want you to pray the same prayer right now from your heart to God's heart. Mean business with God and rededicate your life to Him today. So to receive Him for the first time or to rededicate to say, Dear Lord, I'm calling out to you right now and I'm letting you know that I admit I'm a sinner that I've fallen short of your glory because of the sin and the desires of my heart. I've set my camp up too close to Sodom. But today I want to be removed. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross that I could have forgiveness of my sin, that I could be redeemed, restored. And Lord, now, I want to thank you specifically for the power of your resurrection. Lord, that you proved that you were God, and and Lord, that you defeated hell, death, and the grave. And Lord, I want to claim that victory right now in my life, Lord. I want to claim the victory over the sin, over the, the, the heartache, over the depression, over everything that the enemy is trying to use in my life to pull me away from you. And I'm asking you now to enter me into your refining process to skim the impurities out of me. Lord, that I could be molded into the image of Christ and that I could walk in a manner worthy of my calling to bring you glory with my life. Amen.
If you prayed that prayer, you meant business with God, you received him for the first time, you rededicated your life to him. Right now, boldly, unashamed, I want you to raise your hand and say, Brad, I prayed that prayer. I meant business with God today. Amen. If I don't see you, God does. Put your hands down. We're going to close our service like we do each week here at Impact and ask you if God's laid something upon your heart that you come forward and do business with him. That whatever he's laid upon your heart, you put action to with your feet. Maybe it's coming and letting somebody know you just got saved. Maybe it's coming and letting somebody know you just rededicated your life. Maybe it's coming to join this church. Maybe it's coming and say, hey, I want to serve. I want to be a part of what God's doing. Maybe it's coming and you just want to fall down on your knees and you want to pray for a loved one because they need to hear this message and they need to go through the, re the refining process that only Christ can do in somebody's life. Whatever it is, let's go ahead and stand to our feet right now. Let's sing with all our voice, with all our heart, and let's come as the Lord leads.
part, praise him with your life. There's no one like our God, church. Let's give him a big round of applause. What he does each and every week here at Impact and what he's going to do in the future. Guys, let's take this message. Let's move forward this week and what God's called us to do to get into his refining process. What can we do to make sure that we walk in a manner worthy of our calling? Hey, I want you to check this video out as you leave. Hey, men, come be a part of what we're, what's going on right here this Saturday. Uh, this next Saturday morning, we're going to have a men's breakfast here in prayer time. Here it is right there. I'll be glad. Hey, everybody. Pastor Jim from Impact Church. I'm excited about the men's breakfast this coming Saturday, February 27th at 730 in the morning, uh, right here at Impact Church. We're going to have a number of sporting events. We're going to have a baseball throw, a football throw. We're going to throw an axe. We're gonna have a soccer kick. We're gonna shoot some baskets. We got all kinds of sports going on. And uh, so I hope you'll come out, enjoy the sporting events, have some breakfast with us, sponsored by the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And we're gonna honor every coach in the audience. I'll get to share how God has delivered me from stomach cancer and is using me to reach coaches and athletes in this community and how you can be a part of that ministry. Bring someone with you and uh, let's have some fun and learn how to pursue our God-given destiny. We'll see you there. Hey, Amen. There you go, man. So set your alarm clocks this Saturday. We'll see you right here at 730. Ultimately, let's go make an impact for Jesus. See you next Sunday.